With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Heard Tell Show Friday. You made it, folks. It's the end of the week. I hope you and yours are well. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on Heard Tell today. A lot of stuff to cover. Uh, One of the smartest men in the galaxy, Michael Siegel, our friend, our spacecraft flying, ordinary times writing, sci-fi reviewing scientist friend, is here to talk all sorts of stuff. We'll get with him a little bit later in the program. Always happy to have Michael. Uh, Interesting story to end the show. Uh, You remember the old Bible verse about beating swords in the plowshares. This isn't exactly that, but did you know some of the information on weather that you're getting is coming from old Cold War spy planes? We'll get into that a little bit later on. An amazing human interest story out of Tonga, a man that survived. uh, Just an incredible story there. Plus, we're going to talk culture and politics like we always do, but let's start uh, with the dominant topic of this week, uh, President Biden. He had his press conference. We've already talked about how the reset is nonsense. You can't reset somebody like President Biden. He is who he is, as Popeye might say. Uh, But I want to talk about the reaction to it. Um, Even the fact checkers uh, at Washington Post, which is far from rabid right wingers, had to point out quite a few things that the president wasn't honest about, misconstrued or gave out of context, economics out of context. He cited Um, The Nobel uh, laureate letter that 17 people signed, of course, that was four or five versions of Build Back Better ago. Uh, He talked about being at a plant and using the National Defense Act to um, the National, the Defense Production Act to speed up uh, machinery at AstraZeneca. That, of course, never happened. He went to a Pfizer plant. He didn't use uh, Defense Production Act for that particular thing. Uh, there was the really bad, really awful, and I think it's going to come back to haunt us, a uh, minor incursion gaffe that he said twice regarding Russia, a horrific gaffe that may have real-world uh, consequences. Uh, he also did okay with his written statement, didn't do so good with his uh, questioning. It was a long press conference, but let's just turn down the noise on this for a second. I know we didn't know the actual words. We didn't know the actual gaffes. We didn't know the specific verbiage. But be honest for a minute. Was there anything in that press conference that was actually surprising? Not really. Not if you know who Joe Biden is. Not if you've studied, like we talked about on yesterday's program, the years and years and years of book we have on who he is as a man and as a politician and as a leader. Nothing that happened in that press conference should surprise you. We knew he was going to try to spin things his way, all politicians do. We knew there was going to be gas because, hey, it's Joe Biden. We knew that he was going to try to change the conversation away from the bad things, and the press would ask questions uh, to various stages pushing against that. So if we knew pretty much what was going to happen in that press conference, why the major reaction? Well, it's a slow news day. Uh, It's a big deal. It's the first press conference he's held in months and months. But the reaction is probably overborne because did we really learn anything? I don't think we did. We know who Joe Biden is. We know what he's trying to do. The surrogates and mouthpieces and those folks pretty much told you ahead of time what he was going to do with the reset. We detailed that on yesterday's program where he just went down the list over and over again, reset, reset, reset from different uh, media outlets, which means maybe not the talking points went out, but they definitely all talked to the same people as to what the point was. But if you're not learning anything new and nothing really surprised us, why are we reacting so strongly to us? This is what it gets to when we talk about turning down the news cycle noise. Don't react to the news. Stay ahead of the news. Most of this stuff, we actually can tell what's going to happen ahead of time. We may not know all the details, but we can keep our bearing a lot better because we know what's coming. We know Joe Biden is going to say some really silly, dumb things. We know there's going to be gaffes. Why get worked up about it? We know that his foreign policy is a mess, especially when it comes to China and Russia right now. Don't overreact to it. Just realize it's coming and push ahead. 
there's something to be said for being stable, being steady, keeping our bearing. And when we have big news events like this press conference, and then it blows up virally, and then everybody's talking about it, and you have uh, the news networks because they love to do this format because it makes it easy for them. They have the news item, then they have a guest on to talk about the news item, and then we have a panel discussion about the guest discussion about the news item. That's your first 25 minutes of a news program nowadays. We don't need to react and get stuck in that, though. Yes, the press conference is a big deal, but we didn't really learn anything new here. All the problems that Biden had on Tuesday are still there on Thursday and Friday. All of the issues that dogged him will still be there on Monday. None of this really changed anything, although I will come back to that Russian quote. I think that one's bad and it's probably going to have some effects. I hope I'm wrong. If I am, I will say so. But don't overreact to these things. It doesn't do your cause, your principles, and your politics any good to get too much in the minutia over something that's a trumped-up event in the first place, a presidential press conference. This isn't legislation. This isn't policy. It's just words. And none of these words were per- terribly original words. They were more of the same. So don't overreact to it. Pay attention to what's happening. The Build Back Better f- failure in the legislative branch is now got to be broken up. He finally admitted that out loud. That's a little piece of news that they're going to piecemeal that. But again, we knew that already. We know what these things are ahead of time. So stop reacting like they're a surprise. Don't get sucked into the news media narratives because then you start missing things like the other news of the day, like the economic news, like the COVID-19 news, like news that's going on overseas. Never get stuck in the news media funnel where they always want to talk about the same thing over and over again with the same people without actually gaining anything. This is the old hamster wheel analogy. You do a lot of effort. You're putting a lot of bandwidth into it, but you're not going anywhere. You're just spinning in a circle. Things like this presidential news conference are things we need to keep into perspective. If we're not going to learn anything and we know ahead of time what it is, we can keep our bearings. We can have better analysis of it. We can have a better discernment of these news items. And we can press ahead without burning too much bandwidth while everybody else is caterwauling about something that they knew what was coming, they knew what was going to be said, and it's not really going to amount to much by the end of the business on Friday. These are things that are important in how we do news media. We can all get caught up, but don't. You'll miss things. You'll get emotionally involved in things that aren't worth your time. You only have so much bandwidth. So why burn it on something like a presidential news conference? where you pretty much knew what was going to happen, and you were pretty much proved right. Besides, the folks that are really involved in this are coming at it with all their priors, and every single one of them are going to get out of that news conference exactly what they want, because that's what they set out to do, and they'll accomplish it. So don't be that kind of person. Take these events as they come, keep your bearing, keep your discernment, and understand what these things are. They're presented. They're assaged, they're manipulated, and make sure you understand the bigger picture so you don't get wrapped up in it. More Hertel right after this. Welcome back to Hertel. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for staying with us. We sure appreciate you. However, you're watching and or listening. Thrilled that you're taking the time to be with us. You know, we tagline this show, turning down the news cycle noise. So let's talk about that news cycle a little bit. Uh, on Thursday morning, uh, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, went on Fox News. Now, this turned into a bit of a big deal because people have strong opinions about Fox News on the left. Frankly, there's quite a few people on the right that have opinions about them as well. But I think it's important to talk about this. This shouldn't be a big deal. If you are the press secretary, the designated front person, spokesperson, and mouthpiece for the sitting president of the United States, you should be on the network TVs. I'm one of those folks that actually think what goes on in the Brady briefing room is mostly pointless theater that doesn't really matter. I would like to see less press conferences like that. I would actually like to see more of the people on opposing media or at least media that might push them a little bit. Now, this was mostly friendly. Uh, over Our friends over at Mediate 
Uh, Kobe Hall wrote about it this way, saying, quote, Jen Psaki's appearance on Fox News Thursday morning as a follow up to President Joe Biden's marathon press conference. Things went remarkably well for her and for American Newsroom co-anchors Bill Hemmer and Dana Perino. It's not a stretch to say that the press secretary's appearance was a win for both the Biden administration and Fox News. Is the harmonic convergence actually upon us? Unlikely, but we can hope. Either way, Saki showed off her charm and messaging mastery to an audience that doesn't often see it. And him and Perino asked tough but fair questions that were completely respectful of President Joe Biden's secretary. The mutual respect on view in this political dialogue, particularly in the context of the hyperpartisan divide in which the nation finds itself, was like a breath of fresh air or maybe an oasis of convite. I'm just going to be honest. I've never seen this word before in my life, so I'm not going to butcher the pronunciation. I think it's covivality. Might have to add that to the rotation. Well done, Kobe Hall. You taught me a new word. Well done, sir. Moving on. That suddenly appeared in a desert of political meanness. And no, that's not a dig at Fox News, but rather the current political media ecosystem, which has really deteriorated into apocalyptic hellscape, to borrow the phrase. None of this should really come as a surprise. Saki, Hemner, and Perino are all well-established professionals with reputations. What seems impossibly surprising, but also kind of obvious, is how compelling the interview ended up being and how nice it was to see two sides who normally disagree, but do so without being disagreeable. He goes on with an opinion piece. Um, I think he's probably a little overly optimistic here, but this is a core principle of what we do on Hertel. We turn down the noise and we talk, we discuss, we listen, you know, basic communication stuff. Too much the comm shops of the White House, and this goes to all White Houses, not just Biden, but Biden's been particularly bad at it. They get so obsessed with messaging. They get so obsessed with buzzwords and trends and getting out messaging and controlling narratives and getting to their base and not getting to the wider audiences. I think it tunnel visions them. Again, back to what I started with, what goes on in the Brady briefing room is pretty much a waste of everybody's time, even though I cover culture and politics, both in writing at Ordinary Times and doing this show, Her Tell. I don't pay a lot of attention to the press briefings because they're meaningless. I can go back and read the transcripts if something really important happens. By the way, you don't even need the media for that. You can go on whitehouse.org. They put the full transcripts of all the press conferences up. They're even searchable. You can just get right to what you want. You don't even need the news media to cover a White House press briefing anymore. So I would give a little bit of unsolicited advice to all political figures, Congress, presidents, whoever else, talk to people directly through the media and use opposing media to do it. Go on those media outlets that may not be friendly to you. It makes you look better for trying. You actually expand your audience, and it also keeps you from getting tunnel vision in your messaging. Might be a little Pollyannish, but we can always aspire for better. And anytime the media does something that is better, especially the news media, we should praise it and recognize it. So while we've had our issues with Jen Psaki, she has had some really awful moments at the podium. This is a good one. Keep going on Fox News. Maybe even get brave and go on some other conservative outlets. Do some conservative talk radio. Do some blogs. Do some podcasts. Get out there. It's better for you. And because you are a public servant for the president of the United States, it's better for the country. More heard tell right after this. Tell our favorite by popular demand, Michael Siegel's back, one of the smartest men in the galaxy. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the galaxy behind him. Or as I've already been corrected, that's actually a cloud of some sort of another, isn't it? Yeah, what's behind me is the uh, large Magellanic cloud. Um, So our island of stars is called the Milky Way, and we have a bunch of little islands surrounding us. And this is one of the biggest of those little islands. very young stars in it. And uh, this is a image that's taken in the ultraviolet. So everything you see in there is a very young uh, star uh, emitting lots of ultraviolet radiation. And it's a false color image we made from the Swift uh, telescope. 
Now you, you mentioned islands there. What is it with, because this is your, you know, bailiwick, why have we always used nautical and seafaring terms where it comes to space? I know we do it in science fiction because everything's, you know, space and captains and whatever. Why, why do those terminologies work so good? You talk about islands. We talk about black holes. It's, you know, similar to, you know, uh, maelstroms we find in nature. Uh, we talk about the galaxy in those old fashioned nautical terms. Why do you think that is? Where, where, what's the genesis of that, where that came from? Was it just the closest thing we could think of or what do you think? I think so. Um, just, you know, the ocean for many centuries was this vast unknown, you know, where, uh, you know, people were few and far between and you could go off and never return. And uh, we, you know, covered much of the globe. And I think uh, space maybe has that sort of connotation of these distant things far away and little islands of, of civilization within it. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, probably a big reason why the metaphor occurred to people. And I have on occasion when uh, putting together maps of things for astronomy where we don't know something or where there's something the telescope can't, can't point at been known to write here be dragons on the star maps. Apropos, I suppose. Well, we've never proven that there aren't space dragons, so we have to leave the door <laughs> open, I suppose. Um, let's get back terrestrial for real quick. Let's go back in the Wayback Machine. Uh, as we are wont to do at Ordinary-Times.com, we have these from time to time symposiums, which reminds me we'll probably do for one. Uh, we did a board game symposium, and you brought up a particular board game, and I've gotten to rereading that the last day or two, and I think there's something really interesting to talk about in here. But you, uh, master of the universe, knower of knowledge, uh, dweller of the groves of academe, explain to us the complexities of Hungry Hungry Hippo. Uh, the reason I picked Hungry Hungry Hippos is it just jumped out at me as, you know, and it's become sort of almost a metaphor for kind of mindless simplicity, you know, that during political debates, they'll say, oh, I think the, you know, this party is playing three dimensional chess, they're trying to outwit us, and someone else will say, no, it's more like Hungry Hungry Hippos, you know, there's not that much planning to it, and, you know, it's sort of, but it's this sort of simple thing, and I think sometimes something simple and not too complex uh, can be appealing. You know, one of the things that is very true about the age we live in, we, you know, we're surrounded by scientific concepts, especially now with the pandemic going on. You know, we have these, this constant scream for our attention from social media and from TV. And a fear of missing out is a big thing where people are afraid, oh, I didn't see the latest thing that everyone's talking about on Netflix and so forth. I got to watch that. And life has just gotten incredibly complex. And I think sometimes having something simple uh, that you can just mindlessly enjoy is, uh, is appealing. And I'm sure somewhere on the internet, there's someone who has some complex game theory about the exact right launch angle to use for the green hippo to get the most marbles or something. But, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd just been playing it with my uh, seven-year-old right before I wrote that. And I was like, I should write about this, about how you know, this is just so much fun to just do something this simple. You actually took it uh, to tie it into your love of sci-fi. You started that piece out talking about Star Trek and a, uh, an episode called Shore Leave. And basically the entire planet is a giant amusement park and hilarity ensues because things are not as they seem. We won't ruin it for people that have not yet seen a 60 year old sci-fi episode. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, the line in there kind of dovetails to where we want to go with this, where Captain Kirk comes out. Uh, by the way, played by astronaut uh, William Shatner. We'll get into that later. Uh, Kirk says, quote, the more complex the mind, the greater the need for simplicity of play. I think there's something pretty profound here with what you just said is the more complicated things get and we have more information and more technology and more social media and more everything. I think people just retreat to let me bang this thing as hard as I can for 30 seconds and see if I can win something because I don't know what else to do. I, I think that's very true. I mean, you see one things that are, are uh, have a sort of, I mean, a deceptive simplicity sometimes, but a, a basic simplicity have a lot of appeal. I mean, yoga is very popular. Uh, mindfulness has become very popular in the last few years. I know a lot of people who are into, you know, mixed martial arts or karate, things like that. And uh, people who swear by it saying it just helps clear out the mind. And I think with our modern society, especially with all the computers and stuff, and I'm someone on a, who, with work and with play is on a computer all the time. 
I think just that ability to unplug and be, you know, sort of fall into your body for a little bit is, uh, is, is something that we, we desperately need and can help, you know, sort of balance the, your sanity out a little bit. Yeah. And I think you're the perfect person to ask about this, not just because you're a smart guy and you're a great writer. And, and this piece is wonderful, by the way, it's at ordinary dash times. It's called the stark simplicity of hungry, hungry hippos. Uh, that whole symposium was excellent. Please go check all those things out. But I think you're the person, perfect person to ask about this because your day job is you are quite literally trying to figure out the most complex things we know, the mechanics of the universe, uh, the origins of the universe. Uh, like you talked about with the, the Swift telescope last time you were with us, we're almost like we're looking back in time with this technology in a way how we do these things. You just explained the ultraviolet image behind you right now you're dealing with some of the most complex things man knows about or is trying to learn about really because we keep learning how little we know with it so it seems to me you're the perfect person to ask why is it is it really just a counterbalance or is it something more ingrained and hardwired in us of we only have so much bandwidth and with our technology we might be getting towards kind of the limits of that bandwidth we need more simple I think it's you know, probably a mix of things. I mean, you, you know, you're making my job sound a little more grandiose than it is. Most of the time, it's moving numbers from one column to the other. Yeah, it's branding. But, you're a spacecraft pilot. Don't tell them about the Excel <laughs> sheets. This is branding. Now we're trying to make you look good here. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think there is something very much to that that we are sort of overwhelmed. I mean, we've seen rises in anxiety and depression and unfortunately, suicide and drug use and things like that. And those are all multivariate. You've had much more uh, knowledgeable guests talk about those issues on your show than I. But I, I do think that the pace of society, the constant demands on our attention, it, 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 it burns us out. And that, you know, having something, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be hungry or hippos, it could be anything. But having just some, that, that simplicity, you know, one of, I just saw a paper the other day about how Getting regular exercise is a big help with people who suffer from anxiety, and I'm I'm one of those. And I've been talking to other people about that who are like, yeah, just going for a run uh, can really help reduce the stress levels. And so I, I think that you know that ability to unplug and do something that's relatively simple, at least by appearances, is uh, is a big part of having a, a balanced life. And I, I hate to sound like a new age, you know, I should be having a you know, Netflix show where I, you know, tell people to unclutter their houses or something like that. But I do think there is something to that, that uh, we are getting sort of overwhelmed with the, with the demands on our attention. And I was thinking about this too, is um, I know when I think about it, look at all the data we got on how many health problems are just caused by lack of sleep that, that we're finding out that they found out that sleep deprivation is like being under the influence. And they've got all this data now that something as simple as not sleeping well. I'm one of them. I sleep horrible. I have medications to get me to sleep. I got medications to wake me back up. I, I have horrible sleep for a lot of reasons I'm not going to get into here. They found out that just something as simple as sleep can really completely jack your system up as bad as a disease or a drug or alcohol or anything else. Do we get to where we just look at the stars so much and we look at our technology so much and we're busy with that rat race that it's almost like we deprogram our body to work. And I don't want to get metaphysical either because I don't, I'm not, you know, super big into yoga and stuff. I do think there's something to this that we just kind of deprogram our body from the way it's supposed to work, especially the way our mind's supposed to work. I, I think so. And I mean, with sleep, with the lack of sleep, I think that also plugs into uh, being overwhelmed that the most common reason I think people don't get enough sleep is they feel there's not enough hours in the day. So they stay up late you know, they doing extra work or doing the things they put off during the day, cleaning the house, whatever. And, and then they just don't have enough time to sleep. And then of course you got to wake up and get the kids to school and get yourself to work and so forth. So I, I do think that's, that's definitely part of it. We're talking and to sleep Michael. Medicine, sleep medicine is a, a rising discipline now of trying to help people get more sleep and better sleep and have better approaches to, to how to sleep. And I think that's uh that's a good thing. The big thing you focused on. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. If you've ever had a sleep study, it is amazing how much your brain does crap while you're asleep and you get to see the data. Like when you hit REM sleep and that thing just goes nuts, it's like, whoa. So it's an interesting <laughs> experience. Uh, you can find those videos on YouTube. Go look them up. We're talking to Michael Siegel, our scientist friend, uh, Bon Vivant. 
uh, raiser of children, player of Hungry Hungry Hippos. But we're going to get into his wheelhouse a little bit when we come back from break. We're going to talk a little bit of space travel, uh, some interesting stuff, a new twist on billionaires in space. We'll get into that right after this on Hurt Tell. Ah, it's our tell show. We're with one of our favorites, Michael Siegel. He is a regular because he is just that good. He gives good content, uh, and we enjoy him greatly for it. Uh, you've, we've talked billionaires in space with you before. I actually got to because I had COVID and couldn't talk for a couple of days. Uh, I sat down and actually watched the Shatner in Space Amazon special, and there was a couple really interesting little bits in there that I think uh, proved out some things you said about billionaires in space before, and I wanted to get your thoughts on them. Uh, one is uh, Bezos was talking about him and the other billionaires, uh, Branson, Elon Musk, obviously, uh, kind of the billionaire space race, quote unquote. And he had an interesting comparison to it, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it because you've worked on spacecraft, you're on a mission. He said to him, this era is like the barnstorming era of aviation where, yes, it's more, you know, the, the gentleman of adventure type of people pushing the envelope, but that's going to open up for everybody else, much as the barnstormers went around the country. If you're not familiar with the term, uh, they would take their plane, they would just travel, you know, around the country, fair to fair kind of deal, or just find a field, land, charge people five bucks, take a ride, whatever the case may be. And that's how aviation got popular. That was his take on it. Do you think that's a good comparison that this is a barnstorming era of space travel? Well, the comparison is not new. And Robert Heinlein sort of wrote about that, was writing that kind of thing in the 1950s, where you had barnstormers with rocket ships taking people places. And one of his main characters was Dee Dee Harriman, uh, a extremely wealthy businessman who sort of opened up the moon to human colonization. And I know that uh, Musk in particular uh, has a tendency to be compared to that, to that model. I don't think the comparison is... 100% apt because space is just so much more demanding and expensive. You know, if a plane starts having problems, you can land. And you can go to YouTube and see videos of people landing planes where the engine has failed or something like that and, um, and are able to survive. Whereas space is extremely hostile to human habitation. Uh, to have just people on the space station means dozens or hundreds of people on the ground supporting them. And it's an environment that is just constantly trying to kill you. So it's more like exploring the deep ocean than exploring the air. And if something goes wrong with a spaceship, it's very, very hard to, to survive that. I mean, it, it can be done, as we saw with like Apollo 13 and so forth. It can, it can go catastrophically wrong, as we saw with Columbia and Challenger. So I, I don't think the comparison is quite apt. I do think the comparison is kind of okay in that they they might be breaking new ground. If they can find ways to make it cheaper to get into space, that opens up space to people of more limited means. That also means that the taxpayers will get more bang for their buck when they send things into space because that the most expensive part of most space missions is the launch, the, the big rocket. Um, there's a famous comedy sketch where they're talking about faking the moon landing and they say, well, what's the biggest expense? Well, actually the giant rocket is the biggest expense. So we have to build that anyway. But um, but yeah, I think I, I, I would sort of temper that comparison with the, just the overall hostility and difficulty of uh, sending people into space. The other item that I found really interesting out of this, and this gets into what you do because you do sci-fi and real space science, both with your wonderful videos that you do. Um, I didn't know this, but Jeff Bezos who obviously, because he's so rich, he can do whatever he wants. He's almost became a, a caricature of himself in a lot of ways, like people of that ilk tend to do. But I thought this humanized him a little bit. He talked about one of the real turning points for him with loving space was somebody, and I forget the individual's name, had donated their science fiction collection to the local library, and he found the science fiction collection in the local library, and that started all this, and that started his thing, and he actually pulled out for Shatner, you know, when he was a kid or a teenager or whatever. They had, you know, the paper-drawn tricorders from Star Trek and stuff, and they would play with it. He actually brought him out and had Shatner take him into space with him, this sort of thing. But his a lot of that started with sci-fi. Uh, Elon Musk has talked about his love of sci-fi. Um, 
what is it that the sci-fi of the 50s and 60s, because it came so close to actual space travel, um, but it's still so inspiring to people, those older shows, you know, Musk ain't that much older than me. He wasn't around for the first run of Star Trek and these things. Uh, you know, Bezos is what, in his early 50s now? You know, these guys missed that first run of sci-fi, and yet sci-fi is still inspiring these guys in one lifetime that they're actually in space now. I think especially when you talk about the sci-fi of the 50s and 60s, the sense of optimism and the sense that anything was possible, you know, that we weren't bound by limitations. Nowadays, when we, you know, sci-fi tends to be a little more complex and deal with, you know, deeper issues and so forth. But, you know, you look at, say, Star Trek or Forbidden Planet or something like that. These project a very, I don't want to say necessarily utopian version of, of, human, of a human future, but a very optimistic view. And I, you know, I was born in 1972. I was too young for Apollo. But people who were around for Apollo said during that time, it felt like anything was possible. Like we went to the moon just because we decided to do so. And I think science fiction, really good science fiction has that tendency to inspire people to believe that the impossible is possible. Talking about the possible is impossible. I want to uh, put you on the spot. I find it fascinating that these billionaires in space, they have three very distinctive uh, missions, if you will. Uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk, they're almost, they're kind of taking over the, the crew and cargo mission for International Space Station and Heavy Lift. They're, they're kind of almost like a NASA parallel sort of thing. Uh, Branson has done a space plane where you have the mothership and then the rocket comes off the mothership and, and reaches altitude. And then you have uh, what we saw with Shatner and uh, Blue Origin, which is an Apogee mission where they, they basically just go up and gravity does the work and they, they get into space that way and then come right back down. Uh, Carnival ride, they kind of uh, begrudgingly called it, but that's not completely not accurate. They go straight up, come straight back down. Going forward, which of those three do you think has the most? Now, obviously, SpaceX is working more with NASA because they're actually going to the International Space Station and these things. But commercial wise for the average citizen, if this is really going to become something where people can get into space besides just millionaires, which one of those three do you think has the ticket for uh, commercial success? I think that's the beauty of having billionaires. I don't have to bet on it. We have different approaches and we can see which one ends up working best. You know, you, it's very hard to know a priori how the technology is going to work out or how people people's tastes are gonna work out. You know, people might decide that the space plane approach is the one they wanna do, that it's the most appealing to them. And I think having different guys competing and having different technologies is great because that will let the best, that will bring out the best in all the technologies and let the best technology come forward. I would not be surprised to see all three uh, be viable in some, in some respect. We talked last time about the space shuttle and whether that was a bad model compared to rockets. And I said, I don't think it was because you can do things in different ways. And I think it's the same thing here that with Bezos's approach and Musk's approach and um, Branson's approach, you have different ways of doing this. And I think having that competition, having those different ways is just going to make uh, for a much better scene. And eventually hopefully bring down the cost of this to the point where people of less you know who aren't billionaires can afford this sort of thing yeah because and i and i don't know anything about this you do so you tell me when looking at the because it is and i know it's a documentary so it's shined up as pretty as it can be without all the problems i understand that but looking at the bezos model the blue origin model where it's you know you have a recline client seat capsule which we know because we've put that in the planes now because that cuts down g-forces they go up it comes down. It seems like the simplest approach. It seems like the most understandable to the common person. Like, oh, well, this is going to go up and it reaches Podgy and then it just kind of comes back down. Uh, it's a, I believe it's about a 15 minute flight end to end, something like that. That model for just a kind of a commercial purposes, that seems very easy to understand, very easy to brand. It's like, hey, this is easy. It's simple. It's safe. This is going. That seems like if I'm going to promote a brand, I can explain that in one little soundbite pretty easily. I think that's one of the tickets to making commercial viability, though, too, is you can just explain it in what you don't have to say, well, I got a five stage multi stage rocket that's going to do this, this, this and this. And you got to wait 30 minutes. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, does that make yeah. sense? I think that makes sense that having, you know, 
just being able to say, if you pay us X amount of money, you can go into space. It's only for a few minutes. But, and I think one of the things that was very wonderful about the Shatner flight was that Shatner, kind of known for being a little bit, you know, of a person, was overwhelmed by what he'd seen, you know, with that 15 minutes and was almost speechless. And just the, one of the first things he said was, I wish everyone could get a chance to, to see this you know, to be able to see space and look down at earth and it just changes your perspective. And I think that, and certainly that is a viable model that if you can bring the cost down to say, you know, look, it's a once in a lifetime thing. It'll only last for 15 minutes, but you'll never forget it. I think that's something that a lot of people would, uh, would be interested in. Yeah. That ad pretty much writes itself, don't it? Um, yeah. and, and Shatner is a very, I know we, we kid him about his overacting and stuff, He's a very smart, articulate fellow. Like he really can, like when he settled down and explained it, he was very poetic about it. But yeah, that ad pretty much wrote itself, didn't it? Yep. <laughs> uh, Michael, Bezos, is not a, Bezos is not a stupid businessman. He uh, knew what he was doing. <laughs> no, but, and, but you're a space guy. Just to wrap this up, though, is if I told you five years ago, we'd put a 90 year old man in space, you would have thought we were nuts. Yep. Like Absolutely. that recently, that would have been because what was the previous record? John Glenn, I think he was like 67. Yeah, and he was, 70. was he 70 already? I, I don't remember. But he, you know, John Glenn was the oldest before that, I believe. I think I got that right. The Russians or somebody might have got somebody else up. But if I just told you even a few years ago, we're going to put a 90 year old celebrity in space, you would have thought I'd lost my mind. Yeah. But now it's happened. And we actually, it wasn't a big deal, is what really kind of blows my mind. Yeah, it was something that we should just sort of all watched and enjoyed. Yeah, uh, it's like, vicariously. It's like, wait a minute, we put an actor in space. Like, what the? This is a big deal. Amazing. Yeah, and I think for a lot of the you know of Bezos's generation, a lot of people who are inspired by science fiction, having a member of the original crew of the Enterprise in space meant something. But yeah, it's it's kind of crazy that uh, how fast the technology is progressing these days. Yeah. And before anybody knocks Bezos for that, I uh, just want to point out, in fairness, NASA brought the entire crew of the original Star Trek, the cast, out when they rolled out the space shuttle to uh, pull out the Enterprise uh, space shuttle modular. So the government did it, too. It wasn't just Bezos. Yeah. Uh, Michael Siegel, one of the smartest men we know, also one of the best men we know. You're a good egg, sir. We hope you and yours are well. We love these little treks into science, and uh, we look forward to more videos and writing from you at Ordinary Times and on your YouTube page. Let folks know where they're, they can find you, your social media, what you got coming up on the YouTube videos, and all that good stuff. Uh, I, you just go to www.ordinarytimes. I usually write there once a week uh, what I call the Thursday throughput, which is a write-up of science, and if you click on my name, it'll link to my uh, Twitter profile and YouTube and all that. Um, what I'm, I'm working on right now, I was hoping to come out with it today, but uh, I want to do it right. So I'm doing a astronomer responds to don't look up where I uh, talk about some of the science in the movie and how it struck me and so forth. And uh, hopefully we'll come out next week. Uh, I've, I've already started working on it, so it shouldn't take much longer. And we'll have you on to discuss it because I've got strong thoughts about that movie myself. And we'll get <laughs> into it. Michael Siegel, you're good people, sir. I appreciate your time. Uh, glad to be on. Thank you, sir. Tell show welcome back uh human interest piece this is a shockingly amazing story if you remember or maybe you heard tell about the volcanic eruption around the islands of tonga a uh, massive eruption uh, one of the satellites was actually right over top of it when it happened uh shocking dis uh destruction uh they're still trying to figure out exactly what goes on because again this is an island they cut the fiber optics cable their communications cut off they just got the airport cleared off by just you know straight muscle power uh, to start trying to get some help into these people. But this story from the Telegraph is amazing. Um, the miracle survival of a 57-year-old disabled man who survived in the ocean for 27 hours after being swept away by a tsunami wave is one of the first astonishing accounts to emerge from Tonga. This is from the Telegraph. Um, La Sala Falau, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, because this gentleman definitely deserves it, because this dude's a legend. 
who has walking difficulties, had been painting his home and was unable to escape when giant waves topping six meters struck his tiny island of Atata after a massive nearby volcanic eruption. The waves destroyed homes and eventually sucked him into the dark water on Saturday night, he told Tongan radio station Broadcom Broadcasting after a five-day communication blackout was restored. The Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapari violently erupted with the force of more than 500 times the nuclear bomb the U.S. dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. Satellite images has revealed that Atata, which was a population of about 60 people, was one of the worst affected of Tonga's islands. As Mr. Falau drafted, drifted excuse me, further from the land, battered by the waves, he could hear his son calling for him, but he did not respond as he did not want to put him in danger, he explained. Quote, the truth is, so, is no son can abandon his father, but for me as a father, I kept my silence. For if I answered him, he would have jumped in and tried to rescue me. He would come and we would both suffer, end quote. Mr. Falau managed to find the strength to swim four and a half miles to the main island of Tonga Tapu, reaching the shore 27 hours later at about 10 p.m. on Sunday. What a legend. Uh, what a story of human endurance in terrible circumstances. Um, the Tonga people are legendarily tough people. Uh, just go and ask any professional wrestler that had to deal with any of the Tonga contingent of professional wrestling, even in that very toughest of tough man businesses, they will say, yeah, the Tongans, those guys don't mess with them. Uh, this gentleman, God bless him, managed to survive. Uh, keep the Tongan people in your prayers. I'm sure now that they have communication restored, there'll be charity opportunities. If you are able to give to them, please do so. Uh, Mother Nature is fierce, it is relentless, it is merciless, but the human spirit manages to endure nonetheless as evidence of this story. Uh, God bless this man and his family. I uh, hope he recovers from any injuries and has a nice, long, happy life on a recovered Tonga. More Herd Tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Uh, we always try to end on a little bit of a lighter note or happy news, and this doesn't quite reach the level of beating a sword into a plowshare, but it's kind of close and kind of analogous. Uh, check this out. Down in the Carolinas, WRAL, that's uh, the big station out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, did you see it as the headline? NASA uses retired spy plane to survey and improve snow forecasts. Um, and in this piece, NASA operates a pair of these Lockheed ER-2 aircraft, a modified version of the famous high-flying U-2 reconnaissance planes. That's the planes, not that band from the 80s and 90s that rapidly disappeared, uh, that flew spy missions during the Cold War. Each serves as a flying laboratory in the Airborne Science Program. Since 1971, NASA's ER-2s and the U-2 that preceded them have flown more than 4,500 missions gathering scientific data. They also develop new electronic sensors as well as calibrating weather and climate research satellite. Wednesday's flight that was obvious to people uh, across the Carolinas as the plane took off from Pope Airfield out of Fort Bragg um, was part of NASA's investigatory of microphysics and precipitation for Atlantic Coast Threatening Storm. That makes a nice uh, acronym impacts because we know how the federal government loves its acronyms. Since February of 2020, flights have been conducted from the Wallops Flight Facility on Virginia's eastern shore, spanning from Savannah, Georgia, across the Carolinas to the Ohio Valley and across the New England states. Of course, this is uh, the Appalachian Mountain chain, also the coastal region, so a lot of weather stuff goes on in that area. Uh, across the Carolinas to the Ohio Valley, across the New England states, focusing on clouds that produce snow. Data gathered by these planes will help meteorologists improve snowfall predictions by providing a better understanding of how snow bands form, are organized, and evolve over time. And there's a great little graphic here explaining how the modified E-2 is different from other NASA planes, like a modified P-3, which is a Navy uh, plane originally designed to hunt submarines, of all things, uh, and things like this. It's a really cool little graphic. Um, and there's also a great graphic on here that shows the thermal layers in the atmosphere and how it flies above and below them, how they use what's called drop sponders, which are exactly what it sounds like. They're little transponders that they drop and they measure the air as they go down. Uh, continuing, 
An ER-2 plane looks down on about 95% of the atmosphere flying at an altitude of up to 70,000 feet while its sister ship, the P-3 Orion, originally de designed as a sub-hunter for the Navy, flies through the cloud layers. At about one-third that attitude, these aircraft working with ground observation and weather satellites like the Global per Precipitation Measurement and GOES satellites study the atmosphere from top to bottom in conditions that can deliver snow. A similarly stacked approach has been used by NASA's atmospheric research scientists for many years. We saw this in action several years ago in Western North Carolina. Instruments match those on board recently launched GPM satellites. Cool little story on how you're getting new and updated and more accurate information on things like snowstorms using old Cold War military aircraft and hardware. Pretty cool stuff. That'll do it for Herd Tell for this week, really, Wellness Friday. Uh, another great week of shows. We have had week over week growth in watches, in listenings, in shares, in engagement. Thank you so much. We can't thank you enough because this is a partnership thing. If you're not watching and listening and reacting, I don't have anybody to talk to, and I'd look pretty silly sitting in front of the camera and in front of the microphone. So thank you very much. This is a we thing. Uh, we try to turn down the noise of the news cycle as best we can. We try to talk about things that matter. We don't get into the caterwauling and nonsense of things that don't. And you folks have been responding to it, and we thank you so much. We're going to keep doing it as long as you keep watching and listening, however you're watching or listening on all the podcasting platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google, uh, the algamation places like Podchaser and Overcast, things like that. Glad to have you, however you're doing that. Make sure you subscribe. You can subscribe to in multiple places, don't forget. Also, anywhere like on YouTube, on the Facebook feed for the Big Talker FM, places like this. Make sure you leave a comment and a rating. That means a lot to us. Only costs you a couple clicks. Let's people know that our program is worth checking out as we go through the things we've heard tell in the news media cycle. Uh, you want to contact us? Love to hear from you. Uh, at her tell show on the Twitter. You want to do email? Uh, her tell show at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Keep your bearing. Be nice, but we would love to respond and engage with you. Um, like the show yesterday, our buddy Abby Wolf tweeted us a piece. We put it on the show. That's how it works. Love to have your feedback. Participate. Uh, and again, this is a we thing, not a me thing. The more you involved, the better off we will all be. It not only makes my job easier, but it also makes for a much better show. So wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. If you're on the east coast of the U.S., we hope you're warm because we're going to have some snowstorm issues this weekend. And we'll see you right back here on Monday for more Herd Tell. Y'all take care. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.